Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And if you're not new here, if you are a long time viewer, then perhaps you are noticing that today's filming setup looks a little bit different to usual. And that's because I'm sat at a table with my laptop in front of me, ready to undertake an experiment of creation for this channel. I have, of course, seen lots of other creators do content like this, and I think I know how they do it. But this is my first time giving it a go, so please do bear with me. And if you've got any tips as to how I can do it better in the future, if you'd like me to, then I am ready, willing and able to take that advice in the comments section beneath this video. But today we are taking a first look, I haven't seen any of this series, at the Spanish princess. And as we watch along together, I'm going to be giving my opinions of what I'm seeing. So, you have been asking me to look at this TV show, you have been recommending it. Let's see what I think. Right, so that's about right for me. We're 11 seconds in and I've realised that I've forgotten to mention something for the introduction to this video and that is that this particular series is based upon novels by Philippa Gregory. Novels which I have read but I did read them quite some time ago. So if there have been, shall we say, additions or embroideries to the history as we know it, I may not be 100% sure if they are Gregory's or the team behind this TV series. So if I accuse, not really an accusation, but if I say it's somebody's and I'm wrong, then that might be why, because it has been so long since I read the novels. Also, this first episode is called The New World. So I'm not sure if that's going to refer to the Americas or to the New World as presumably Catherine's going to know it, but I guess we'll find out as we continue watching. Well, it's amazing to see the Alhambra Palace being represented here. I'm not sure if they are filming on location and I will have a look and if I find out then I will pop some words on the screen to say whether it is filmed on location or on a film set. But the Alhambra Palace is somewhere that I have long wished to visit and as soon as it is safe, I will be trying to make plans to get out there. I think the way they've opened this up, that this is a union of necessity, is fairly accurate. I would perhaps have said that this is more necessary and more useful for England than it is for Spain. Spain can potentially find rich allies elsewhere. I think England is more in need of the wealth and power that Spain brings. Obviously Henry VII is the founder of a nascent dynasty on the English throne. We've had years and years of civil war, the, the Wars of the Roses, and also at this time England, not to put too fine a point on it, is a volcanic anomaly in the North Atlantic with precious little power on the world stage. So yes, it is a union of necessity, but to my mind, I would say that England's probably getting the better deal by getting an Infanta of Spain out of it. But anyway, let's continue. OK, so we see Catherine there hiding a letter from Arthur from her mother. And that letter seems to have been written in English, when in reality, the common language that this pair share is Latin. Catherine's encouraged to learn French so that they will have another, presumably, more evocative language to communicate in. Catherine will pick up English in England and by the time she actually becomes queen she can speak good English but also these letters that appear to be both smutty and secret, that part really goes beyond credibility as far as I'm concerned. This is a dynastic marriage of state. Any missives going between this teenaged future married couple are going to be hotly observed, probably dictated and or written by another hand. The notion that somebody wouldn't have read Arthur's letters before it left England 
and then in Spain before it's given to Catherine, and that the reverse wouldn't have happened in the opposite way, mm, to me, stretches credibility. You're going to want to observe what's being said between these two people because uh, an enormously expensive, both in terms of time and cost, diplomatic treaty rests upon it. But anyway, let's carry on. Okay, so that was really, I mean, I love a good battle sequence, but unfortunately, I, there's not a lot of historical accuracy in there. While Isabella was absolutely on campaign with her husband, there's nothing to say that she is actually involved in the fighting. You can be a warrior queen without actually lifting up a sword. Doesn't mean she didn't have a set of armour. And I'm very pleased to see that this armour they have Isabella wearing doesn't have weird moulded boobs as a breastplate, that it's just a straight form thing that kind of comes across that would fit a female form and work. Slight bugbear is she's wearing leather gloves with no metallic protection of the hand. So it's not an armoured glove and the sword itself would not protect her. So I would think that you would have an armoured glove when the rest of her is so well armoured. Love the gorget there. Probably would have a more elaborate face visor. But apart from that, really interesting. She would not be swinging a sword, even when fighting to reconquer Spain. You don't put your king or queen in the front lines. I mean, that's chess. You protect your monarch. Now, that's not to say that people didn't engage in these skirmishes, but for the most part, you're going. You're not going to send a monarch to fight against foot soldiers. You're going to try to protect them as much as humanly possible. But I think it's supposed to show that we have a warrior queen teaching another future warrior queen. And so in that respect, it's very interesting for the narrative that we're going to see. It, it's a beautiful fight sequence, amazingly choreographed, but in the realms of fiction. That's not to say that there weren't uprisings and rebellions of the Moorish people, the people who wanted to continue to worship uh, their Muslim faith, that that didn't block Catherine's journey to England, but it wasn't a face-to-face -face struggle as we're seeing here. Also, where's her dad? Because as far as I'm aware, Catherine was accompanied by both parents to the coast to board the ships to go to England, but we're only seeing Isabella here. Where's Ferdinand? Because to my knowledge, he would have been there too. I'm not sure which pregnancy of Elizabeth of York is supposed to be being represented here um, because I know she gets pregnant after the death of Arthur because it is that final pregnancy uh, on the 2nd of February, where she delivers on the 2nd of February in 1503, that ultimately ends up costing her her life. So I'm not sure who she's supposed to be pregnant with when in 1501, Catherine is on her way to England. Um, maybe we are seeing a contraction of time here, I'm not sure. So there we are seeing the indomitable Margaret Beaufort, the future grandmother-in-law of Catherine of Aragon. And she is stage managing majesty and monarchy. And potentially that's quite fitting. She was certainly one of her son, Henry VII's chief advisors. And, and in many ways, she is the reason that he ends up on the throne. She marries well, she plays the game well, and she brings him back from France. And she is a vital player in the building of this Tudor dynasty. But I think there's a lot of stories of her being fairly difficult to be around and knowing exactly what she wants. And I do wonder if Margaret Beaufort had been born a man, whether we would potentially have her represented in quite the same way or whether she would just be your average run-of-the-mill power broker who was very good at their job. Warwick is the kingmaker, but somehow Margaret Beaufort is the harridan. Anyway, we'll carry on. So I'm going to throw up a painting of women in gowns that are just like the ones that are being worn here. And they are wearing 
Spanish farthingales. So those kinds of very clearly delineated hoops. This has obviously been taken, I think, straight from this painting. This is a really well-researched piece of fashion history. Um, the fabrics are potentially a little bit more detailed and have some colours that maybe are somewhat unusual, I would think, for the time. Um, also, Catherine Aragon would have been veiled when she arrived in England, the tradition being that Spanish brides-to-be infantas are veiled before their wedding. It would have been a more opaque veil than this, and we're going to get to that. As I mentioned in my video on Catherine Aragon, she is hidden behind this veil and her future father-in-law later demands to see her. I wonder if we're going to see that being represented in this episode or in the series in general. Okay, so once again, she can't speak English. They are going to converse in Latin. Um, this degree of self-assuredness is lovely. It does seem so far that Margaret Beaufort is had a little glint in her eye, enjoying her future granddaughter-in-law being so spicy with her. But yeah, I'm... this is also bringing up the question of when a couple is married, which I have made a video on, again, the uh, legalities of marriage, because when somebody can be considered to be married at this point is up for debate, whether it's at betrothal, at proxy marriage, at marriage before God, before witnesses, whether you can be married in secret, whether you have to consummate a marriage, and as we're going to later find out, that the provision of children, and then also specifically sons, can mean that a marriage of many decades actually never happens. So it's interesting this is being brought up as to when a marriage has been finalised, and therefore when a person can legally claim the rights of a spouse to that person. So they're already keying in to questions that are going to be asked in a few decades time from what we're seeing now. So this is a representation of something that did in fact happen as Catherine arrived in England. Henry VII did turn up without prior warning. It wasn't the agreed upon protocol. It wasn't how things were supposed to play out. He turned up and demanded to see Catherine before essentially allowing Arthur to see her and handing her over, I suppose, and agreeing finally, although she's already in effect married to him, and there's nothing going to get in the way of that, as this character does say, but he wants to lay eyes upon her before he allows Arthur to see her. When this happens, there is a massive kerfuffle, but it's not Catherine at the vanguard. She has a team of people around her to have these awkward and diplomatically dangerous conversations. What's happening here is in effect a diplomatic incident. If Catherine was getting embroiled in this, what's the point in having this team of ladies and also male ambassadors surrounding her? Why would they be there if she can argue the points herself? That's that's not what happened. Um, they did say that she was supposed to remain sequestered away until her final marriage being celebrated, and that she was supposed to stay veiled, as was the custom of Spain. But in the end, Henry and his requests and desires, they did win out, and Catherine was forced to show herself to him unveiled. So that did happen, but that was after diplomatic wrangling in which she took no public part. So it seems like somebody was writing Arthur's letters for him. That's the way they are portraying it. And that they're also showing that he had no knowledge of those letters being produced or the responses that came from them, um, which perhaps is possible in this surveillance state. Although the fostering of a union, these letters did go back and forth. Why Arthur wouldn't know about them? I don't know why they would choose to do that or be allowed to see the responses. As I said, these letters that did pass between them certainly wouldn't have been smutty or secretive in nature. Throughout this episode, we have seen that Elizabeth of York is suspicious of Maggie or Margaret Pole, and equally that Margaret Pole is herself very unhappy. She blames Catherine of Aragon for her pain. She wishes her ship would sink. Equally, we heard Henry VII talk about how much was done to get Catherine to England. 
And what they're all talking about, what this rift has been caused by, and this is probably going to be a spoiler for me for future episodes, is the fact that Margaret Pole's brother, who was Edward, Earl of Warwick, had been executed in 1499. And he was executed as part of securing the Tudor dynasty on the throne. He was the son of the Duke of Clarence, George, Duke of Clarence, himself, brother to Edward and also to Richard. So he is that Yorkist line. Therefore, Margaret Pole is also the first cousin of Elizabeth of York. These people have a claim to the throne of England, arguably a better claim than that that was held by Henry VII. In order to secure an infanta of Spain as a bride for this juvenile dynasty, blood had to be spilt. And the blood that was spilt, and I think we saw it with the snapshot of a boy being beheaded, the blood that was spilt was the blood of Margaret Pole's brother. He was executed when he was 24 years old. I mean, they're making the tower look very ominous. And of course, for us, the tower does have a particularly bloody legacy. But that is something for a future time. And what Buckingham says is completely right. The royal apartments at the tower were luxurious. Yes, it's a fortress and a stronghold, but it's also an incredibly luxurious palace. It, it provides lots and lots of functions then and right up until now, although it's not a lived-in palace now. There are numbers of functions that the tower still provides. Uh, I will leave a video that I made on that linked in a card as well. Um, well, all I can say is he's awfully big for 10. I mean, at the most, he's he's 11, depending on what time of year we are. No, he's 10. He's awfully big for 10. Okay. Um, right. <laughs> I mean, I thought that Catherine and Arthur were played by actually looked a little bit old for them, you know, being in their mid-teens when they meet. But <laughs> this is now, oh boy, this is stretching credulity. He looks older than both of them. Anyway, carrying on. Okay, <laughs> shark jumped, and I don't think that that was in the books either. The I don't seem to remember there being a lot about the love letters in the Gregory novels, but she certainly portrayed Prince Henry as being a child of ten, which he was when this is all happening. So he certainly wasn't the one who Gregory has writing these secret love letters between Arthur or posing as Arthur to send to Catherine. So this is uh, the TV team that have done this, and I'm not quite sure why, but Henry is coming across as being super threatening and kind of creepy. So there we have it. Elizabeth of York, first of all, describing herself and her character in a way that is really quite beautiful and I think accurate. It, it feels real to me that that is what Elizabeth of York was, that she was a reed that would move with the wind but was just seeking to not break and considering the backdrop that she grew up against that's I feel a very accurate way of wording it she's also just told Catherine of Aragon of the particular price that was being paid to bring her here and it's not just Warwick of course that dies because it's also the pretender Perkin Warbeck, who is executed in 1499. And there are some that think that Perkin Warbeck was not really a pretender, that he was, in fact, Elizabeth of York's brother, Richard, Duke of York. So there we are at the end of the first episode. And as we see, we have a card at the end screen saying that some of the events of this history have been changed for dramatic effect. And that's to be expected. It is historical fiction. The clue's right there in the name. And I don't have a problem with that. I know there are some academics and people in history who do have a problem with historical fiction because of the liberties that are taken. But for me, I think it can be incredibly powerful. I think the historical fiction can drive people towards an interest in history. And that's always going to be a good thing for me. But as with so many things, historical fiction can be done well, at least as far as I consider it to be, and also badly. And it's done well 
when you have an underlying basis of historical evidence that has been well researched. And into that, you weave a fiction. So you start to fill the gaps in our lack of knowledge. The fact that we can't be a fly on the wall in private apartments, the gaps in the records or the letters or the diary entries, you fill that up with dialogue and with personality. And yes, that filling up is the imagination and the interpretation of the author in question, but it sits, or in its best case, it should sit on a framework of historical evidence. The issue is for me when those fictions become anachronistic. So when you take Isabella of Castile, warrior queen, and you show her actually actively fighting enemy combatants and doing so by herself without her husband at her side, that is starting to step over the line of anachronism for me. The biggest one in this case, the one that to me borders frankly on the unforgivable, is the choice to make the 10-year-old Prince Henry into a grown man, and a predatory and frankly creepy grown man at that. I am baffled as to why that choice was made. Thinking about it now, perhaps it's because they want to contract time, so I'm not sure when in this series Arthur becomes ill and passes away. Perhaps they're going to shorten in the series Catherine's widowhood. Maybe they don't want to go to the cost of having a boy, an actual boy of 10 in the first episode to then have Arthur die and then have a really quick elapsing of seven years in which Catherine would have had to have aged seven years and then this new Henry turns up. So if Catherine's going to look the same age, and then Henry's going to go from being a 10-year-old to being the man who plays him in the later series, maybe they felt that would be too confusing to the audience. I'm not sure. Maybe you could let me know what you think is going on there in the comment section. And also, if you enjoyed this kind of video and you'd like me to make more, perhaps on this series or another series, do let me know about that in the comment section as well. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel. And while I have you, maybe make sure if you think you're subscribed that you are indeed still subscribed. I'm seeing lots of people telling me that they have gone to check and that YouTube has unsubscribed them without them consenting to do so. So do make sure while you are there checking and or subscribing slash resubscribing, why not also hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.